Hey hey, Marcus House with you here. I've got an exhilarating ride as we take a peek into the latest news from SpaceX and Starship development this week, more insights from the aftermath of Booster 7's static fire, huge support work for the launch mount and related systems. We had this Frankenship taking the stand as well, so a lot of great stuff to compare here. Then we have scientists discovering a groundbreaking method for discovering near-Earth asteroids using the James Webb Space Telescope. More beautiful Falcon 9 action as launch cadence accelerates, but some not so great news on a second leaky vehicle at the International Space Station. Yikes! Then we've got a new mission awarded to Blue Origin. So yes, there is no shortage of stuff today, so strap in. Kicking off the aftermath of that epic 31 engine static fire over a week ago, just look at these simply amazing photos that SpaceX posted more recently. There is just so much information in these locked away. Just check out this one. First off, you can probably recognise the grid fin actuators on the forward dome, as well as the two main autogenous pressurisation pipes entering the methane tank right from the forward dome here. That is not all though, as I suspect some of the wrapped up boxes here could very well be the flight computers. nested beneath the interstage connection ring, we can also see this, a battery most likely providing power to the flight computers, and much more. Interestingly enough, there's also this orange device right here. It could be that they have something to do with the wireless communications between the booster and the ship, because they don't really have a wide connection point as far as we are aware. There is also these connections, and I'm wondering if one of them is actually leading to a camera inside the methane tank, something that we've seen in the past with SN11. So what new information have we learned about the static fire test since last week? Just take the acoustics as one example. Many nearby seem to think that the test seemed quieter than they would have expected. Could that be true though? With 31 engines firing together, the constructive or destructive interference from each of them can be quite fascinating after all. Well. Who better to ask? I tweeted Elon himself who replied to the query here, indicating that anecdotally it wasn't as loud as they expected. That is great news, but is it somehow intentionally designed in, or is it just pure luck? Cosmic Perspective has some great slow-mo footage of the most recent static fire coming, so keep an eye out for that. But this earlier one from a few months ago is also captured in exquisite slow-mo detail. You can see here the amazing vibrations of the plume pushing the gases around. I don't know if it's even possible to somehow control the resonance of each engine to manipulate the acoustics or not, but if so, that would be a pretty cool way to reduce noise. Alright, so let's again visit the updates on the speculated water deluge system. Once again, SpaceX seem to be absolutely flying through the progress here. One of the main new things to note is the rapid assembly of all of these walls around the perimeter. If I had to guess, this would be to capture the remaining water that such a system would have left over. That is because this water probably can't be released straight into the environment as pollutants may need to be filtered out beforehand. Now, you may remember I've talked a few times about one of the hydraulic power units, or HPUs, on Booster 7 going missing. This drives the thrust vector control system for the inner booster engines, but why was it taken off? After a lengthy delay, a new one was delivered at the launch site, and it was marked as serial number 15. Quite the interesting fact about this HPU is that it originally came from Booster 8. Later that very day, the other one was taken off the booster as well. I'm still not sure why we are seeing these being swapped out, but it does make me happy that SpaceX has switched to the electric thrust vector control systems for future vehicles. Now, SpaceX has been taking delivery of all of these shielding plates over the last week, as spotted by Zack here initially. What are these for though? Well, fairly certain that these are orbital launch mount shields. These renders here by Ryan Hansen should give a pretty good idea of how it will all come together. Here is another one from how it should look from inside. The crews here should still have plenty of room available to walk around and work on added modifications, but yes, sadly soon we're not going to be able to look at all of the intricate internal systems of the launch mount once the covers go up. Just amazing work done here by Ryan Hansen, and yes, there is some more amazing stuff coming soon, so keep an eye out. Now these shields of course are crucial, they're not just here for looks. The huge mess that 33 Raptor engines could create is no joke. Just look at the aerial shots from SpaceX and you can see that even at 50% thrust, already you can see flames shooting over the orbital tank farm berm. Just in case you were wondering, Elon shared with us that SpaceX aims to run the Raptors at 90% thrust during that initial launch attempt, hopefully still to happen sometime in March. 
But why 90% and not 100? Well, my guess is that Starship will be flying with almost no payload, so there should be plenty of margin for that test flight. In fact, I suspect that they would want to run the engines at lower thrust simply to have less chance of any anomalies, and that gives a better chance of capturing all the data that they can get through each stage of the flight. Once a few flight tests are done and they grow with confidence, they should then ramp them up to full power. Now, check out this bare looking starship here making an appearance this week. No heat shield tiles or fins at all. Yes, Ship 26 finally left the high bay and immediately rolled towards the launch site late Saturday evening. There it was, turning into the launch site, and just before 1am in the morning it was parked next to suborbital pad A. After an absolutely stunning sunrise, the temporary quick disconnect plate, which allows SpaceX to pressurise the vehicle during transport, was removed. Just look at the scale of this thing. You can see here that they are using these rubber o-rings to properly seal all of the connections, and there we have it. It was time for it to be lifted onto the suborbital pad. So with this ship prototype missing all of the hardware needed for reuse, why does it still have its nose cone and thrust section pins to mount heat shield tiles? Well, you may recall that in the past, this very nose cone actually did have tiles, but then SpaceX removed those. Now there is a lot more intriguing stuff to discover here compared to previous ships, likely changes that we'll see implemented on future ships being created. This here is a flight termination system box, and it has changed. When compared to previous ships, it is now a lot more angular. Looking right below that at the liquid oxygen tank, that has now gained some support stringers on the inside. Those would add a little mass, but I suspect would also allow SpaceX crew to work inside of the tanks without needing to hook it up to the crane for added support. Down at the thrust section, this extra strip has now been fully enlarged to fully overlap the weld from below the thrust dome. Just below that, we can see these weld doublers again. Now I covered those in greater detail a while ago for Ship 24, but for Ship 26 we get extra detail and we can see that they do indeed run all the way around the ship, including where the thermal protection system tiles would normally go. It is a bit of a Frankenstein ship really. Over here, these are the remains of the aft flap hardware right next to one of the engine chill lines. We of course expect to see that the hardware will return with Ship 28, that will be the next one to get the full set of tiles back. Before that though, production of Ship 27 has finally restarted. Its forward dome was moved inside of the high bay, followed by its nose cone stack. A few hours later, SpaceX used that bridge crane to place the nose cone on top. Just like Ship 26, Ship 27 is also not going to have any of those tiles installed, but it does thankfully have a star link Pez dispenser. That, I will say, does look to have a lot more reinforcement than the previous ones that ended up being closed off. So yes, it has been a big week for SpaceX in Texas, but one thing you may have missed is the news on the two oil rigs named Phobos and Deimos. SpaceX, of course, had planned to convert those into offshore launch platforms after purchasing them in 2020. I've had no shortage of questions from people asking what's going on with these ships over the past year, and I can now finally give you an update, and that is that SpaceX have just sold them. Yep, Gwen Shotwell has stated that they were not the right platform, but are still interested in sea-based launch platforms, so I guess we'll need to see where it goes from here. We also have an unexpected asteroid discovery to talk about. Observations of a known main belt asteroid located between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter were conducted by the James Webb Space Telescope to help calibrate and test the performance of some of MIRI's filters. However, amazingly, while analysing the data, the team found a small asteroid in the same field of view. How small? Well, very actually, quite comparable to Dimorphos, which was the target of the DART mission. This freshly spotted asteroid is about 150 metres in diameter, similar to the size of Rome's Colosseum. Now it is yet to be confirmed as a newly discovered asteroid, but what is interesting is this. It seems to currently be the smallest object spotted by James Webb, and more importantly, the team suspects that any MIRI observations made closer to the plane of the solar system could almost always include a few asteroids, many of which will be totally unknown objects. This is great news, I think, because these smaller sized asteroids are notoriously hard to detect in abundance. 
With this new method of asteroid detection, we could redefine our view on this region of space and increase our chances of spotting potentially dangerous asteroids. The sooner that we can find them, the better chance that we've got to target them for future redirect missions. I just think it's amazing how much we've discovered about the depths of the cosmos, and yet we still find it difficult to agree about events taking place on our own planet. This thought is what inspired Harleen Kaur, a former NASA engineer, to build a news platform. So since I was a little girl, I read I really wanted to be an astronaut, and I was lucky enough to work for NASA. I got to work on a program called New Horizons, and it was the first spacecraft that was being built to be sent all the way to Pluto and beyond. Later in her career, Harleen was working on jet engines for Rolls-Royce, the manufacturer of the Malaysian Airlines Flight 17 engines, when she received information on the fatal double engine failure in 2014. It was amazing that we had to wait hours till a camera crew, a journalist, went to the site and figured out what had happened to the plane. And to be honest, we still really don't know what had happened to that plane and who shot it down. She started to think about better ways to share news and verify information in real time by comparing multiple perspectives from journalists on the ground and around the world. Just recently, and more than eight years later, an international team of investigators released their analysis of what actually happened to Malaysian Flight 7 Team, which you can read all about on Ground News, the platform Harleen built, a tool built to be able to anticipate the problem of misinformation that's going around and not just passively complain about it. If you have been following my channel lately, you'll know that Ground News has been a valuable resource for me. And if you'd like to think more critically about your news consumption, go to ground.news slash Marcus to learn more. Thanks to Ground News for supporting this video. We've had some really amazing Starlink action this week too. SpaceX's Falcon 9 Booster 1062 took off from Space Launch Complex 40 from Florida last Sunday. This was its flight number 12, trailing the record holders with 15 flights. And in this one, it was carrying 55 Starlink satellites to the fifth shell in orbit. Another breathtaking nighttime launch that we had here, a totally blinding liftoff actually. It never gets old watching the booster light up the night sky, but in this particular case, they kept the ground camera fixed on the booster, showing that plume expansion as the altitude rapidly increased and the atmosphere thinned out. Just look at that, and I've obviously sped this footage up here because it continued all the way to main engine cutoff. I think it is worth a quick mention that this launch actually broke the pad turnaround record for Falcon 9. This launch took place just after 5 days, 3 hours and 38 minutes after the Amazonas Nexus mission. So with the payload's fate now in the hands of the upper stage, attention shifted back to that booster and its return to the drone ship. Yet another textbook landing incoming on a shortfall of Gravitas. No signal loss at all, and of course, the successful deployment of the 55 Starlink satellites was confirmed on Twitter along with these wonderful shots. Falcon 9 there blasting off with the waning moon here in the background. In fact, I think this is now my desktop background for the week. Of course, that wasn't the end for Starlink action because at the end of the week, another batch launched from across the country from Vandenberg Space Force Base. This time we had Falcon 9 Booster 1063 on its ninth launch with another batch of 51 Starlink satellites. Yet another terrific burst there through the blue skies, and just a few minutes later we had that good separation. The upper stage ignited its engines and there it went on its way to put those satellites into orbit as well. Here another landing burn again for the second time in the week. I will say that it seems that the launch cadence is really continuing to accelerate, and when SpaceX keeps making it look so easy, well, it's really no wonder, is it? And there we go, another touchdown, this time on the drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You, the name of course from the Culture Series novel The Player of Games. That is the same for the drone ship, just read the instructions too. Many don't actually realise why the ships are named in this odd kind of way, so hopefully that clears it up for you if you have been curious. With this mega constellation growing every week, we are starting to see Starlink coverage rapidly expand again just recently. We have a Japanese airline which is soon also going to have Starlink connections, and with that, quite a few new Starlink availability updates now on the map getting that sweet blue access. We've seen tweets announcing that availability in Colombia, Brazil and Iceland, and then Elon himself announced Starlink in Italy. That is great news for all of these countries. 
So would you also believe a third Falcon 9 launch for the week? Yep, that's right. Just a handful of hours ago, as I was about to render this video to get it up in time, we had the Inmarsat 6 F2 mission. Yep, Falcon 9 has indeed pulled off a hat trick this week with this booster on its third mission. Again, from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral, a beautiful flight all the way up to stage separation, fairing deployment, and there we could see the Inmarsat 6 there on its way to a geostationary transfer orbit. Of course, while that was taking place, the Falcon 9 booster there landing on the drone ship. Just read the instructions. Three amazing landings this week on all three drone ships. How cool is that? Last week, you may recall that I talked about the Progress MS-22 successfully docking to the station to provide those much-needed fresh supplies. Soon after that happened, though, we received some quite shocking news. The predecessor of the newly docked Progress, Progress MS-21, which is the one currently docked to the Poisk Zenith port, encountered a serious problem. Its cooling loop was depressurized just half an hour after the new spacecraft docked. What? Yes, it looked like we were seeing another leak. Now, the hatches between this and the station were open, but the temperature and pressure aboard the station was all still normal. The crew were all still safe and sound. So what's going on here? This leaky progress, MS-21, was launched all the way back in October to deliver cargo to the station. Now that its mission was complete, it did seem like this issue would delay the undocking process for quite some time. However, instead, this vehicle has now been loaded with garbage and was undocked just hours before uploading this week's video. The cosmonauts at that point rotated the vehicle after undocking and took pictures of the damaged area for more information. The big worry here is that the first leaky Soyuz MS-22 was discovered back in December a few months ago, a strikingly similar problem. Now, I've been covering that fairly frequently here, but if you have missed it, in a nutshell, this Soyuz suffered from a cooling radiator leak. Unlike this new leak, which is hard to see directly, MS-22 was very visible. In fact, we could even see the matter showering out of the spacecraft's radiator after spending about 80 days at the station. After some investigation, the leak was considered to be due to a micrometeoroid hit. A second leak just under two months after the first one, though? Yeah, that does raise a little more suspicion. The possibility of this also being another micrometeoroid strike on the same external cooling radiator of the spacecraft is probably well beyond plausible. This now instead has many thinking that the issue is more related to a common internal defect. Just think about this. The first Soyuz MS-22 leak happened after being docked at the station for around 85 days or so. And if you take a look at this image released by Roscosmos at the start of the week, this brownish stain right here is the leak area from that same leaky Soyuz. If we zoom in even further, you can spot this tiny hole. That bruising effect around it is usually evidence of a micrometeoroid impact. Ever since the first Soyuz MS-22 leak, NASA and Roscosmos have been working towards sending a rescue spacecraft to the ISS to bring back the three stranded crew safely. The top priority before this second leak was found was to finish up the Soyuz MS-23 vehicle and launch it uncrewed to autonomously provide that recovery. That launch was supposed to happen on the 20th of February in just a few days, but now that has been delayed as the research continues. So anyway, hopefully everything is going to be sorted out and checked to the nth degree before they give anything else a green light, and best of luck to all those involved as they try to find useful data and proof as to why both of these leaks have happened. Now, you may or may not have also spotted the recent news of NASA selecting Blue Origin to provide the launch services for the Mars Escape and Plasma Acceleration and Dynamics Explorer's dual spacecraft mission, or part of the Venture Class Acquisition of Dedicated and Rideshare Launch Services contract. Might just use the abbreviations for those at this point. So, Escapade, much easier to say, was originally set to launch with the Psyche mission, but the trajectory requirements had since ruled this out as a secondary payload. That, of course, course, left its fate in limbo for a while, and now we've got pretty clear confirmation that Escapade will launch on Blue Origin's new Glenn rocket from Space Launch Complex 36 at Cape Canaveral. This launch is being suggested for late 2024, but since New Glenn has yet to fly, it's going to be intriguing to see if that window slips or not. Interestingly, this Escapade vehicle is built around Rocket Lab's Photon platform. There will actually be a pair of identical spacecraft intended to study how the magnetosphere of Mars interacts with the solar 
solar wind, along with the processes that is driving its atmospheric escape. Why do they need two of them though? Well, they need to work together to provide observations from two points, essentially to provide a stereo picture of this very dynamic environment. This field of research is super important, especially if we do intend to become a multi-planet civilization, with Mars being our first destination, understanding its magnetosphere in intimate detail is absolutely vital. That is because, unlike the one that Earth has got, which protects us from the worst of the radiation hurled at us from space, Mars has one that is patchy at best. Could there be stable pockets of electromagnetic fields that could assist in finding a better Martian base? Well, hopefully we are soon going to find out, and as is quite so often the case, there is an added benefit. Mapping those fields in detail would not just help us form a better model of how the Martian environment has changed over time, but it gives much better insight into planetary evolution in general. So that is about it for the week my friends. If you love the content I create, do consider helping me out by subscribing if you're not already. A big welcome to you if you are new to the channel. We couldn't do it of course without the many patrons and YouTube members here as well supporting away. Links for all that is below if you'd like to join up, get ad free versions of these videos and access to our closed Discord channels. I love chatting with you guys in there. If you want to know a little more about why radiation in space is such a big deal, and also why we need incredible research missions like Escapade, hit that tile here in the bottom left and there are some more deep dives on the right too. Thank you everyone for watching and I'll see you all in the next video.